Hello, everyone. My name is David Myers. I'm the executive director of the Conservation Finance Alliance and um, technical uh, uh, strategic advisor to the Global Fund for Coral Reefs through the UNDP. And we're really thrilled to have this webinar here. This is um, a series of webinars we're launching that um, supports the GFCR Reef Plus community of practice. And um, this is a, a wide uh, a group of, of practitioners working on coral reef finance globally. So um, I'm going to just do a, a quick intro introduction to um, to what the Reef Plus community is and then go over the agenda. Um, the agenda for today, we'll do an introduction from Mr. Uh, Jabinex Batista, who's a deputy director of the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Then we'll have a presentation from Dr. Fanny Duvre, head of marine programming from UNESCO World Heritage Center, followed by a case study by Mrs. Beverly Wade, who's the director of Blue Bonds and Finance Permanence at the uh, Office of the Prime Minister in Belize. And uh, she'll be telling us about the Belize uh, Reserve System World Heritage Site. We will have time for Q&A, and um, I'll be moderating that. And um, yeah, very much looking forward to to getting into the um, the topic. But let's start with uh, um, oh, just yeah, quick introduction to, to Reef Plus. Um, there is a, a QR code you can scan to join the community. Um, you can discover news and different uh, events going on. There is a whole range of different solutions they're called, um, which are different ideas around uh, coral reef uh, conservation and finance, connect with the community of members, and you can share your solutions and your organizations on the site as well. So please connect up to that and become a member. You just have to provide your, your email. And um, and now I'd like to pass it to um, to Yabinex um, for um, a quick overview. Java. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, and welcome everyone to this GFCR Reef Plus Community of Practice um, webinar. It's it's really a pleasure to have you all joining us. First, I would like to thank um, UNESCO, Fanny, for partnering with us in this webinar. It's it's really exciting to, to be doing this with you, one of our um, institutional partners in the GFCR. So this is part, part of that growing partnership that we have with you. So thank you so much to you and your team and also Beverly. It's really great to, to be here with you again. I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, hearing about the Belize experience in, in this area before. And I think your insights are gonna be very, very important for, for this discussion. And we're also very proud to have Belize as one of the countries where the GFCR is also implementing a program. And I hope also that as part of this webinar, we can learn from what you have been doing in the country and see how synergies can be created between our program in the Mesoamerican region and the work that you have been um, conducting. Um, I mean, I think David explained really well what is the role of, of these webinars, but it's the I just want to emphasize that this is one of the ways in which the GFCR is looking at creating a virtuous um, cycle of knowledge to continue to expand the development of what we call reef positive solutions, which can include the development of reef positive businesses. And these would be businesses that address coral reef drivers of degradation and other financial um, mechanisms. And it's important that we keep this in mind because we know that we have an urgent task at hand. We all know probably uh, all of us that are attending this webinar that coral reefs are severely threatened um, by climate change. And that is, of course, compounded by the local drivers of degradation. So we have a tall task here. Um, and at the same time, it is one of the most um, um, underfunded ecosystems around the world. So, so the challenge is, is big. But at the same time, it is meetings like this one and the work that institutions like UNESCO, GFCR, and other partners are doing that always bring hope so I would like to make sure that as part of this discussion, we keep that word in our minds. It is important that we keep hope and ambition to make sure that coral reefs continue to provide the ecosystem services that we all need in this world. And that's why I also would like to highlight that as part of that hope and as part of that ambition, um, very recently um, in, in September last year, and then again in December last year, the Coral Reef Breakthrough was was launched 
And through that breakthrough, which is a call for true action around coral reef conservation, including finance, we are hoping that at least $12 billion of resources can be mobilized by 2030. And this, of course, being aligned with the objectives of the global biodiversity framework and ensuring that coral reefs are at the center of the 30 by 30 um, target that we are all aiming to achieve by the end of this decade. Um, for those of you that perhaps don't know GFCR, I'll very briefly explain what we are and what we do. We were launched in September 2020. And in a nutshell, the GFCR is a blended finance vehicle that is dedicated to accelerating sustainable businesses and finance solutions that address local drivers of coral reef degradation. And this is to improve the resilience of the coral reefs, of the local economies, and the people that depend on them. That is in a nutshell that we do. Um, this is a worldwide coalition and it's in, it includes two main instruments, a grant fund that is managed by the UN in partnership between the UN Capital Development Fund, the United Nations Development Program, and the UN Environment Program, and then an investment fund, which is managed by our partner, Pegasus Capital um, Advisors. Um, so last year was a very exciting year for us. We actually were able to expand our portfolio of activities from 12 to 19 countries around the world. And since inception, we have been able to mobilize already um, directly to these two mechanisms that I just mentioned, $225 million. And the aim of mobilizing those resources as a blended finance mechanism is that we can then leverage and attract private sector investors to continue to scale and replicate this reef positive business and financial solutions. Um, and maybe I would like to take one more minute and highlight why blended finance is important in this, in this fight against um, climate change for coral reefs. And it's because we already know that grants are not enough. The conservation of our marine resources are, has for too long depended only on grant financing. And we know that's not gonna make it. We're not gonna make it through just with grants. So we do need to find an approach and multiple approaches probably through which we can really have the private sector also contribute to um, ensuring that our natural capital and our coral reefs including, included in that can continue to thrive into the future. And that's also why this partnership that we have with UNESCO is important. Um, when you think about the World Heritage Sites, I think we're all always awed by, by those places. And, and UNESCO is always working on making sure that those places um, continue to awe us into the future. They, they provide great visibility to what we all want to aspire and the ambition we want to accomplish. And, and I'm, again, I'm very thankful to you, Fanny, and to the whole UNESCO team for being with us today, um, sharing experiences and talking about the way forward for coral reefs into 2030 and beyond. So with that, thank you very much. And David, over back to you. Thank you so much, Jabba. Really um, great overview of GFCR and um, some of the issues we're, cha we're challenged with here and, and uh, trying to, to solve. Um, before we get into the webinar, which is uh, entitled Stepping Up Investment in World Heritage Listed Reefs, um, we're just going to do a quick poll, if you don't mind, to if you could share with us some of the topics that you'd be interested in hearing about um, uh, for other upcoming webinars. So you can either um, go to slido.com and uh, put in that number down below, or you can scan that, that QR code um, that you see on the screen. And we'll be able to um, to receive your your suggestions, and they'll pop up on the screen as well. So, um, so again, just uh, scan that code, um, and uh, I'm going to do it myself just to make sure it works. Of course, it works. Um, and uh, yeah, and then put some of your suggestions in. We'll give you a, a minute to do that. Thanks.
Okay, excellent. Seeing some really good suggestions there. So, you know, keep them coming, add several. All right, looks like uh, restorations strong, blended finance is strong, impact investing is great. Um, biodiversity credits and offsets, sustainable finance, case studies, blended finance. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for doing that. Please um, don't, uh, don't stop typing, but um, I'm going to move us into the main webinar. And um, for that, I would very much uh, happy to present Dr. Fanny Douvre, uh, who's head of Marine Program Natural Heritage Unit. And um, Fanny, you'll take us from there and then we'll come back to Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, Fanny, over to you. Super, thank you, David. And thank you to the whole uh, Global Fund for Coral Reefs uh, team to set up this, uh, this webinar, this online meeting. Uh, so I will give you a quick um, uh, overview of what marine war heritage is, uh, what we have today, and what the benefits are uh, for the, of this war heritage listing, but also a little bit of how it works to get to a war heritage uh, listing uh, and how the process works um, to get a site designated. So I have about 10 minutes um, to go through that presentation, and I suggest we go right away to the next slide, please. So today, uh, I think everybody probably is familiar with World Heritage. We, of course, have over a thousand sites all across the globe, um, and the, major the large majority, two thirds of them are cultural sites, uh, cult cultural buildings for the most part uh, that are truly exceptional places uh, to humanity. Now, we also have about 250 natural World Heritage sites of which 50 of those today are located in the ocean. So if you think about the fact that the ocean is 70% of the globe, 50 sites is actually not much. Uh, in recent years, it has accelerated. Um, and there's also a number of sites that probably will get on the list in the next couple of years. But today, you see the map here in front of you. We have 50 marine war heritage sites, three of which are currently on the list of war heritage in danger, meaning that their special values for which they are inscribed on the UNESCO war heritage list are actually in danger today. And the stars that you see on this map, this is where the coral reefs are located. So we have today among those 50 sites, um, 29 uh, that actually include coral reef ecosystems, and they're pretty much distributed across all the continents um, uh, of, uh, of the world. I will tell a little bit in the next slide um, of what it actually means. Um, oops, something that um, didn't uh, translate there correctly, but so as I said, 50 marine war heritage sites, they're distributed across 37 different countries. The interesting thing is that even though they cover only 1% of, um, of the ocean by surface area, they're actually hugely important um, when you look a little bit uh, about what those ecosystems really represent. For one, uh, the coral reef ecosystems on the World Heritage List cover about 15% of all coral reefs across um, the globe. They represent over a hundred different indigenous communities um, across the world. We did a very extensive study with some of the top scientists um, in the field of blue carbon a few years ago, and we realized that those sites also cover about 20% of the world's blue carbon. Um, whether it's tidal marshes, we have some of the biggest mangroves um, on the UNESCO World Heritage List, and also some of the biggest uh, seagrass areas, like for example in Shark Bay uh, in Australia. What you're not seeing on this uh, slide, but which is a figure that we um, researched last year when we looked at the biodiversity of marine war heritage sites, that is that also over 35% of all marine species on the IUCN red list uh, are reflected and represented across those 50 marine war heritage sites. So while they're very small in number, uh, they actually re represent a huge amount of our global marine biodiversity and ecosystems and also a huge diversity of people that actually uh, live there. 
About half of all the marine water heritage sites are located in um, developing countries or countries in uh, transition. And uh, 19 out of the 29 coral reefs are also located in um, developing countries, of which a number of them overlap with the Global Fund for Coral Reefs and for which we also um, established a partnership between UNESCO and the Global Fund for Coral Reefs um, uh, a number of months ago to step up our collaboration. Now in the next slide, um, I'll give you um, a quick overview of what it is that we do. Of course, many people think that uh, World Heritage is uh, just a list and um, UNESCO just hosts that list and there isn't actually very much that is happening. But UNESCO uh, and especially World Heritage, we are very much um, what we call a standard setting organization. And we do that on a number of fronts. We don't do that alone. We do that in a uh, partnership. But I would say that there's three key areas where our work really uh, is concentrated. One is building management capacity. And what I mean with that is when you work every single day across 50, eventually 50 marine protected areas in very different socioeconomic contexts and, um, and type of ecosystems, you see a very big commonality across those sites. That is that there's a lot of things happening, a lot of projects happening, a lot of research happening in these um, various sites. But a lot of all these individual uh, activities are not necessarily joining up for the kind of conservation outcomes and results that these sites really need, especially when we see it uh, in a climate change context and against um, the very tight deadline, however, that we all have set by uh, to have effectively managed marine protected areas by 2030. So we have in a lot of these sites a bird's eye view to look and work together with all the different stakeholders that are working and operating in these marine protected areas and try to build capacity to um, build a more holistic approach to, um, to the conservation. And we do that, for example, for car reefs with our partner, uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, Foundation. The second component of what we really invest a lot of time in is to bring uh, the latest innovation for monitoring, especially when it comes to biodiversity. We have a huge uh, initiative running currently uh, in which we basically built a very hands-on practical tool uh, to use environmental DNA to monitor your um, site's marine environment. It can be done with kits. We um, uh, mobilized over 20, 250 children across 21 different sites in the first um, snapshot that we took of biodiversity. And we are looking at ways of how we actually in a more instant way can get a snapshot of biodiversity and in a lot of ways this for us and for the sites critically important because it will allow us to also understand how climate change is impacting that the last component is of course the negotiations with governments to try to have key conservation gains on the ground and i think Many of, many of you have seen our work in action, for example, last year in Australia's Great Barrier Reef, where we um, agreed with the government uh, to have an investment of over a half a billion dollars to reverse uh, negative water quality uh, and pollution, um, and where uh, Australia also, through the influence of UNESCO, signed for the first time a climate act that will keep now their temperature um, below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times. So these are, you know, some of the examples with various others, but I think it's one of the places where you have seen our work uh, in action. Now, in the next slide, um, a few words of what the benefits are when it comes to a UNESCO World Heritage listing. As I said earlier, many people think that World Heritage is just a prestigious recognition it's a place that is on everyone's bucket list uh, to go diving or to go uh, you know, visit the special values and biodiversity and ecosystem of that place. But what very, people, very few people realize is that, yes, of course, in the very first place, it is a prestigious recognition and it also drives revenue to the country. There's no secret about the fact that the World Heritage Convention is a hugely successful convention for over 50 years 
to a large extent because of the economic return that a country gets once a site is listed on the World Heritage List. But what very few people realize is that the moment the site is inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List, the country in which it is located, but also every other country around the world takes the joint responsibility to actually protect that site. So a critical and, and um, exceptionally valuable uh, aspect of World Heritage Listing is that it brings international attention for local conservation issues. Of course, not all the issues, you know, not every local conservation problem becomes an international concern. But when it's down to really critical things um, that are happening in a particular place and that make that that place might lose its special values for which it is inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List, there is a mechanism in place where UNESCO will go in at the highest level of government, will talk to the government, and if it really doesn't want to work, will uh, inscribe a site on the UNESCO list uh, in danger. It's something that countries do not like to see in many places around the world. Of course, also because it touches upon the economic return that a country can have, but it has a huge benefit as well to catalyze uh, both investment, financial investment, but also just simply the political will to put in place the conservation um, regulations, uh, to put in place the policies that are needed to protect that place. It is also, once a site gets inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List, it becomes part of a international system of monitoring. And that is pretty much the task, the statutory task of UNESCO to oversee the state of conservation of every site that is inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. We monitor across all sites about 150 sites every year um, for which we make recommendations to the countries. And of those every year, about 12 to 14 marine sites are part of that uh, evaluation. And finally, a big benefit as well is that a site and especially its local management and science teams become part of a global network of excellence. We are of course looking all the time at the problems in those different sites, but every single uh, three years, we also bring all the managers from across the world together um, to discuss solutions and what actually works in these sites. And collectively, these marine world heritage managers have um, thousands of hours of experience of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to conserving uh, these marine protected areas. So we bring that together and make a huge investment to distribute and try to replicate um, successes that um, are working. So a couple of words in the next slide of how uh, UNESCO World Heritage works. So the, the critical component when it comes to UNESCO World Heritage, slides are gone, I see, but a critical uh, component of how UNESCO works is that central aspect of what we call outstanding universal value. So the central concept um, of um, outstanding universal value is that a site is so exceptional to humanity, both from a cultural or a natural perspective, that its protection should be a shared responsibility across all countries across the globe and not just left to one country by itself. And this was inspired, of course, in the 1950s when the Aswan Dam in uh, Egypt uh, was being built and the temples of Abu Simbel at the time would actually today be underwater if it wouldn't have been for 80 countries that pulled together at the time in the 1950s about $50 million to actually dismantle those temples and move them up to higher grounds where we still can benefit them uh, from them today. So the same in coral reef ecosystems, the same in marine uh, areas, some of these places are so unique that their protection should be an international and common shared responsibility of us all. In the next slide, a few words on um, how you actually become a World Heritage Site. So we have 10 World Heritage criteria, both cultural and natural. Four of those are criteria that are specific for uh, natural sites and this, by definition, also marine sites. 
So every um, site, every marine site, every coral reef that uh, wants to become a World Heritage Site does at least need to reflect one of the four criteria. So either it is it has a superlative biodiversity, and there we're looking very often at biodiversity that is um, in, endemic and that you don't necessarily find anywhere else. Um, we're also looking at areas that uh, reflect major stages in Earth's history, uh, and that can be limestones, for example, in um, uh, in Hanoi and Vietnam, but that can also be very exceptional coral reefs that have been built over billions uh, of years. We're looking also at exceptional ecosystems, again, ecosystems that have a value that um, is unique on the world and that you don't necessarily find anywhere else. And then the last one is unique beauty. Now, unique beauty, beauty is of course something that is in the eye of the beholder, right? Uh, as we all know, that criteria isn't necessarily taken in and by itself. It is often taken in um, combination with one of the three others. But if you look across the marine water heritage sites and especially the coral reefs, all of the coral reefs are pretty much inscribed for their ecosystems and for their biodiversity. And then there's some of those coral reefs like the Galapagos Islands, for example, or Australia's Great Barrier Reef are inscribed for all four uh, of the natural heritage criteria. A very important component is that the values, so the ecosystems, the biodiversity, the um, stages in earth history, do have to be present at the time of inscription. So the World Heritage List does not protect places that have been so degraded that their um, features, their natural features aren't there. And that's why it is important that a site is has its integrity and that it is a place um, that is that is that of which the boundaries are large enough that it actually features all of the different um, areas. So a few uh, words to the next slides on how you actually nominate um, a World Heritage state, um, Site. It is very much a, what we call a state party led um, process. So it is a country that puts a World Heritage Site forward always. Um, so a country and the World Heritage Convention is nearly universally ratified. We currently miss about four, four countries uh, around the world and it's four small countries, uh, mainly in the Pacific with whom we are working today to also ratify the convention. Uh, so basically every single country around the world can uh, put forward the nomination for uh, a World Heritage listing. So the first step is that a country makes an inventory and submits that in inventory as its tentative list to UNESCO. Every site that then um, is nominated for a potential World heritage listing has to be already one year on the tentative list. So it's basically in the first stage, the country that says, look, I think I have a place that is of outstanding universal value. I would like to um, take it forward. The country will prepare what we call a nomination dossier. So we have very strict guidelines of how a dossier is being put together. The, the central part of such dossier is to illustrate that the site that is being put forward for potential World heritage listing, that that site has outstanding universal value. So typically in a coral reef ecosystem, it will be compared um, with what is already on the World heritage list and it will illustrate that the site that is being put forward has significantly different and also universally unique features. It takes a country typically about um, five years, three to five years to build a nomination process. Some are faster, but it is a quite significant amount of work that typically involves um, a, um, a, a team of scientists that are having really in-depth knowledge about uh, the place. Once the nomination dossier is received by UNESCO, we do a completeness check. And once it is complete, it goes to our advisory bodies. Sites can be uh, so inscribed for all of these four natural criteria. It can also be what we call a mixed site, uh, like the Palau Southern Lagoons, for example, are inscribed both for their ecosystems, but also for their special 
cultural features of the way that people lived uh, for over 4,000 years in connection with um, the coral reef. So the advisory bodies um, will make a uh, evaluation. They will visit the site. Typically, these are visits of about seven to 10 days. They will look at all the features, uh, look whether the site actually does meet the World Heritage criteria, and then a recommendation will be made to the World Heritage Committee. So the World Heritage Committee comes together uh, once a year. It's always somewhere around June, July of every year. And the World Heritage Committee is a rotating body of 21 member states. Uh, and you can find the countries that are currently on the World Heritage Committee uh, on our website. They take every decision. The first week of, uh, so they meet for two weeks. The first week they will go through what we call the state of conservation. So really looking at the sites, conservation of sites that are already on the list. And the second part of the week, they will go through the nominations um, for new inscriptions. And so uh, every year, basically, we have a number of new inscriptions and there are a number of marine sites um, that are being put forward. The whole uh, process, once a uh, country has deposited a nomination, uh, which is also always done by the 1st of February of every year, that's the deadline by which a site need, a country needs to submit its nomination dossier. It typically takes a year and a half, 18 months, uh, shortest uh, for a site to become inscribed. And so to complete my, um, my talk, the World Heritage Committee has multiple choices. So we can immediately inscribe a site if it agrees that the evaluation uh, is indeed positive and the site has a, uh, meets the World Heritage criteria. It can say no, uh, it doesn't meet the World Heritage criteria, so it does not get inscribed. And it has two alternative intermediate options where it basically asks the country for more information or for updates. Uh, and that is typically uh, when it comes to the management. There's no World Heritage site that can be inscribed that doesn't have on a national level already some form of management because the country also has to demonstrate that it actually has some uh, basic capability to protect the values for which that site would be inscribed on the World Heritage List. I'll finish there. There is a last slide um, that just shows uh, some of the guidance tools on how to inscribe um, and nominate sites for the tentative list and then how to prepare uh, a nomination file. And in the q and I'll be happy to um, uh, answer any questions you might have. Oh, back over to you, David. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fanny. That was um, really uh, some great information and a good descri description. Now over to, to Beverly Wade from Belize, who will tell us about um, her experience. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank um, UNESCO and the Global Fund for Coral Reef and UNDP for inviting us um, to share a little bit about our experience in Belize and to talk about um, how the World Heritage um, Site in Belize have really um, been, have become the foundation really for us to look more broadly at our blue space in Belize, our blue economy, and also looking at how we can now um, bring in non-traditional and innovative financing for um, these resources and responsible blue economic development in Belize. So thank you again. Next. So I could, um, we could move past this slide and, and I'll just start with the presentation. So just a little bit of background um, for Belize. Our Belize Barrier Reef Reserve System World Heritage Site was inscribed um, back in 1996. However, in 2009, our site was then placed on the World Heritage List in danger. And this inscription was basically a reflection of critical gaps in the management of the property, policies and regulatory framework that were deemed necessary to maintain its outstanding universal value. Next. So in 2015, 
the government of Belize, along with its non-governmental partners, academia, and UNESCO, elaborated an ambitious roadmap, um, our desired state of conservation, which outlined um, the realization of key policy and management interventions for really now safeguarding the OUV of our property. And that um, implementation of that roadmap really led to the removal of our site from the World Heritage List um, in danger in 2016. And this included some key things. Um, Fanny mentioned earlier in her presentation that sometimes when sites are listed on the, the um, World Heritage List in danger, that it can catalyze good things. And that is exactly what happened in Belize. It allowed the government to recommit itself to ensuring that our World Heritage Site is safeguarded, but it also um, created an excellent collaboration and between partners that were on the ground along with the government to ensure that we now have a framework in place with key elements that would then speak to ensuring that activities that were happening in and around our World Heritage Site were being done in a way that it was not injuring that outstanding universal value of the site. Some of the key things that were passed um, through that roadmap was a very comprehensive revised integrated coastal zone management plan. There were key legislation put in place to ensure sustainable small-scale fisheries in Belize. There was a cessation on land tenure in the property itself. And of course, there was a moratorium on offshore oil exploration. Next. So Belize um, in 2020 um, decided that it would now put very much front and center its blue space, its resources within that blue space and activities in that blue space um, in terms of its national development pathway. And it re and the government of Belize then did, created a new ministry, which is referred to as Ministry of Blue Economy. Along with that focus and clear ambitions and new commitments were made by the government of Belize to now look at those resources, its natural capital, and how can you now use your natural capital to one, address national priorities, and secondly, to, to um, catalyze and to promote economic development growth in Belize. At that time in 2020, um, Belize was a country that was very much debt ridden. Um, it was recovering from the COVID pandemic where our um, national economy actually contracted by 16%. And so government um, was looking at how it can address its national debt, its single largest um, commercial national debt. And at the same time, um, look at an opportunity to now leverage its strong history now in environment, good environmental stewardship, and, if, and its natural capital to bring in monies that it could have also reinvest in our blue space and in a natural capital within the blue space. Um, so government was able to negotiate uh, the at that time, which was referred to as the single largest blue bond, um, where we realized a discount on the debt. We actually reduced our national debt um, by 25% of GDP. At that time, our debt to GDP ratio was approximately 133%, which was very untenable. But in the deal that government did, it was able, as I said before, to now leverage um, our good stewardship of our marine environment and also the current resources that we have within our blue space to now establish a long-term sustainable financing mechanism for marine conservation in Belize and, and to also create a clear roadmap that was now reflective of new ambitions 
new targets and conservation measures as it related to our marine um, environment and those resources within that space. Next. So our Blue Loan Agreement, which is one of the agreement under our Blue Bond, is very much contingent on the implementation of a conservation funding agreement, and which very much involves our Belize Barrier Reef Reserve System. Next. So, as I mentioned before, a big part of our implementation of our Blue Bond Agreement is the delivery on the on, on a roadmap for conservation. Um, that roadmap um, has eight conservation milestones that are time bound and that are very much centered around now looking at the responsible stewardship of our Belize Barrier Reef system, its associated ecosystem and also looking at key policy areas that are also needed for us to ensure the functional integrity and to safeguard um, these precious resources that we have. So central to these conservation milestones is the expansion of our protected areas in Belize to up to 30% of our total ocean space by 2026. Um, Belize was already one of the countries that has signed off on the 30 by 30 agreement, which is, which is now enshrined within the global biodiversity strategy under the CBD. And our Blue Bond Agreement is reflective of that high ambition and that commitment by the government of Belize to now look at our entire total ocean space and to now ensure that we have adequately um, treated key areas in that area in terms of conservation um, priorities. It also um, it is expected that we would deliver now a marine spatial plan, which we have now named Belize Sustainable Oceans Plan by the end of um, year eight after signing on this um, Blue Bond Agreement. This builds on some of the work that we did um, in ensuring that we removed our oral heritage site from the, the list of sites in danger through the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. And so it is now expected that the Marine Spatial Plan would now extend out to our total ocean space since the ICZM plan was only uh, concentrated in our coastal zone area. Um, this we consider as being very important for us as we now embark on a pathway for responsible economic growth and to also ensure that the country um, is in a position to now um, realize opportunities for um, economic growth within its blue space but at the same time that it has a plan which ensures that all the considerations are taken into, are, are taken on board when looking at how this space and its resources are being approached. Other key areas that are um, included in these conservation milestones are the designation of mangrove reserves. Um, within our World Heritage Site, one of the commitments that the government of Belize made was to ensure that all existing national lands within our World Heritage property is now um, designated as mangrove reserves. And those milestones have been realized already. Um, and as I said, we're also looking at how do we now bring management effectiveness to the, to the protected areas which also makes up our Belize Barrier Reef Reserve System property um, to ensure that we have management plans in place and also to now bring another level of effectiveness to the management of these areas by and, um, getting them included on the IUCN green list. And finally, to strengthen the coastal zone management um, in Belize 
by revising and updating their legislative framework and also their plan. Next. Along with those conservation milestones that have a strict um, timeline, the government is also encouraged to now look at other areas that also ensure the functional integrity of the um, resources that are within Belize's blue space, and also to ensure that key policy, key frameworks are in place um, to address activities that would be happening in this space to ensure that we do not undermine the outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site, but and also those areas that are outside of the World Heritage uh, property. So government is expected to put in uh, management and policy framework for mariculture um, to ensure sustainable mariculture in Belize, continue to work um, on the framework to ensure sustainable fisheries in Belize, looking at the environmental impact assessment regulations, which really is the instruments that is expected to ensure that development is not being done to the detriment of those resources that are within our blue space. And I just want to mention here that there's a specific requirement in those uh, for those environmental impact assessment regulation to now make mention to now make mention and to create a provision where the OUV of the World Heritage property must be taken into consideration for development that would happen within the property. And those regulations were passed, um, have been passed already. And so as a matter of fact, I was just reviewing an EIA um, this week where there's now a specific section within these EIAs that are now looking at how the potential development is um, going to impact the OUV of the site. Um, as I mentioned, there is a focus for the World Heritage Site under the Blue Bonds to ensure that we have these um, policies in place to ensure that we bring to the site the conservation priorities to maintain its OUV. We're also looking at how do we now um, put in a framework for blue carbon? How do we now translate all the good work that we will be doing in terms of conservation and translate it also into an economic um, activity? How do we now benefit from the good conservation efforts and, and ensure that we're also now looking at these um, blue assets as exactly that, as assets with the potential to continue to bring in inflows, whether it's for development or for continued support to um, conservation. And finally, um, to look at watershed management, Belize is a country on the mainland and we have huge watersheds that influence our, our reef system and our blue space. And so to look at management plans for some of the key watershed. Next. So in terms, I wanted to mention our approach for Blue One implementation. One of the things that we've learned even back then in 2015, when we we're looking at now um, removing our site from that World Heritage, that list of World Heritage in danger. Um, we realized that as we now create greater ambitions and look at blue bond implementation in Belize, that it requires the highest level of coordination in country. Um, these deliverables are, they span across mandates of the whole of government, various ministries, they're multi-sectorial, and you're working with a very broad stakeholder base. Um, and so it required that this, this kind of um, coordination and delivery is championed at the highest level. And so the Blue Bond um, unit was um, established 
under the office of the prime minister to facilitate the highest level of coordination and to ensure that the ambitions that the country has committed on are properly mainstreamed and implemented. Next. One of the key um, organizations in terms of the delivery of our blue bonds is our Belize Fund for a Sustainable Future, which was our conservation fund that was created to channel the conservation flows from the government of Belize into to support um, Belize's conservation commitments under the Blue Moon Agreement and to contribute to the stewardship of um, a sustainable future for our people and the environment of Belize. Um, this Belize Fund for a Sustainable Future is a independent um, body. It has an, a non-government majority and it is responsible to allocate um, those monies that government um, deposits for marine conservation on an annual basis to both government and our non-government on the ground partners. As I said, to deliver on our commitments under the Belize Blue Bond, and also to look at other areas that would support um, marine conservation and sustainable and responsible blue economic growth. Next. So in terms of our success and looking at the future, through the Belize um, Blue Bonds, Belize was able to leverage its natural capital, um, approach the private sector, who is our primary partner in this, to reduce our national debt, um, reduce our debt services, which allows, allowed the government of Belize to have much needed fiscal space, realize savings from those savings, have the government commit to long-term financing for marine conservation actions over 20 years through annual inflows and also through the capitalization of an endowment fund. And so we're looking at long-term conservation over a period of 20 years through, as I said, these annual inflows and beyond that 20 years from the the mature, the, when the, the endowment fund becomes mature. Next. We're also now in a position where um, we have a concern, we have successfully demonstrated that we have a mechanism that could now be looked at um, to now leverage its success for new initiatives for finance permanent. We now have a very real commitment from the government of Belize now in valuing our natural capital and integrating that natural, uh, natural capital into decision-making policy and even now into the development and, and, and financing of key areas in Belize. And we have now secured a space, a credible space for private sector investment and options in Belize. And so what we have basically done is to um, have a tested model, which is already being um, replicated and where our um, blue bonds deal has now been used to um, inform and to facilitate new blue bond deals such, such as negotiated in 2022, and last year now, the single largest blue bond by Ecuador for the Galapagos. And so those two um, initiatives were basically um, based on the success and the model that was created by the Belize Blue Bond um, in 2021. Thanks. So I just wanted to mention, um, just to highlight two of the other initiatives that we're working on. This, um, this webinar is very much looking at how we could leverage 
um, our success in blended financing, which is really what the blue bond is. It's a debt restructuring, but it's very much um, blended financing also where we have now brought on board the private sector in a very um, important and significant way. But we're leveraging now our experience and our success with our blue bond to work on a project for finance permanence in Belize, which is which we now refer to as resilient bold Belize. And basically resilient bold Belize is a blended finance approach again, that's looking at building on what we're putting in place through the blue bonds and to now move even further with our national ambitions and agenda. In last in September last year, the government of Belize um, endorsed what we refer to as a people-centric conservation agenda. And that agenda has central to it the protection of 20% of Belize's coral reef, the full protection of 20% of Belize's coral reef. And so it is expected that the marine spatial planning process that we're currently um, implementing through the Blue Bonds Agreement start taking into consideration this new target and this new ambition for coral reef protection in Belize. But it is expected that the main vehicle to now realize this and also to bring financing to this will be this PFP. And so the PFP, as I said, um, is expected to build on what we would have achieved through the Blue Bond and also to look at um, other areas that we think are important. It's based on five pillars that are going to be focused on ecosystems protection and restoration, livelihoods and well-being, which um, we have signaled as now being one of the components that we're very much key on. Protected areas management, of course, to continue to ensure the effective management of all that 30% that we would have established and institutional policy and reform and sustainable financing mechanism. So what Resilient Bold Belize will be doing along with Government of Belize is to now establish and put in place these long-term sustainable financing mechanism that is expected to continue to support conservation and responsible blue economic growth in the league. And I believe that's my last slide next. And so I invite you all to um, follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channel. Um, if there are any information that you would um, want from us, you could contact us at our email address there. And kindly download the link that's there. Um, that link will take you to our first, our report for our first two years of implementation of our Belize and um, Blue Bonds. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Beverly. Um, what a um, exciting time for you know coral reef conservation in Belize and with the Blue Bond and and the project finance for permanence and and the. UNESCO World Heritage, so much going on, but I'm afraid we've run out of time, basically. Um, so for, for, for those of, of you that need to, to go, understand, but for those of you who are able to stay around for a little bit, we can do a short Q&A. We have a few questions that have come in. If you're able to stay on for a little bit, that would be wonderful. Um, so just real quickly, I'm going to summarize the questions that are there. Um, you know, what one question was about, you know, what would be the procedure for an NGO to 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 get funding for some research development or innovation for coral reefs and the blue carbon ecosystems? Um, so that came from Guillermo Corona. Um, Justine um, was asking um, about sites that are degraded and adjacent to listed sites, and if you can include them in a listed site, would that encourage restoration? But that was an interesting. Um, Point. And then the final um, question was around the blue bonds from Tanya, um, which was asking, um, you know, what are the metrics that are, are, are being proposed by finance institutions such as Jeff? Are there standardized metrics for, for blue bonds? And, and um, how might the UNESCO evaluation indicators be, be related to, to that? So 
opening up to either of you to to respond to those those questions. Can I quickly answer the question on blue bonds? Um, there are no real standardized metrics <laughs> um, for these deals, but what we are seeing um, happening more and more is that these deals are really looking, um, people are looking at these deals to realize these um, climate ambitions, these sustainable um, best practices ambitions and conservation ambitions. And so what is really used as, as a metrics in these deals are a lot of the, um, the measures that countries have agreed upon in their NDCs and, and a lot of the, the um, targets that are now being put forward at, at the national level and at a global level through these very important frameworks, no? So um, that's the first thing. Um, I, I'm not sure, uh, in terms of the deals that, I guess Fanny could talk about this a little bit more, but I could tell you from our national perspective that we are now working on a national core reforestation plan in Belize, and we very much include these degraded areas in that plan um, that are adjacent to these, to these areas, one, because we're not only looking at it from a from a conservation of healthy of of health healthy and thriving areas, but also to look at areas that are important for key activities that are dependent on coral reefs. Um, and so our national restoration plan not only takes into consideration um, looking at key areas that are important from a resilience standpoint but also looking at how we can basically increase the, the coral cover in country and, some of, and to realize some of those important ecosystem services that come from healthy coral reef. Great, thanks Beverly. Honey, did you want to um, respond? So perhaps to that question about adjacent uh, areas. So, um, as I said in my presentation, uh, it is important that when a site gets inscribed on UNESCO World Heritage List, that those key um, features that make up the specialty of that site, that they are indeed present at the time of inscription. Now, of course, you know, this is a World Heritage Convention that was created in 1972. And um, 50 years later, uh, when it comes especially to climate change, there's a lot of things that are changing uh, in those different sites. And it's something obviously that, you know, we need to evolve with. Um, an important component is that you have a um, car zone that is uh, the boundaries of the World Heritage Area. There's a lot increasingly sites that are also submitting what we call a buffer zone, which is a much larger area around uh, the site. But um, you know, in a dynamic ocean system, you cannot you cannot see those boundaries strict. Everything is of course dynamic, uh, and so what's happening outside of these um, uh, world heritage areas impacts very much the conservation in that area. So, so the way we are starting to really look at uh, areas is that is to look at those larger uh, areas that would be inscribed that support the integrity of what is on the UNESCO World Heritage List and to uh, make sure that some of the areas that are critical to it but are not necessarily in the greater of shape that those can be part of the larger uh, buffer zones. What we're also seeing, especially in, um, in Latin America, uh, in Coiba National Park, for example, in Cocos Islands, in Costa Rica, in the Galapagos Islands, in Ecuador, that the national protected areas um, are being expanded uh, considerably. And that um, uh, that is, however, also part of looking at that component that is internationally designated, which is World Heritage, to make sure that the, the overall area is well protected uh, also for reasons of connectivity. So it isn't always necessarily inscribed on the World Heritage List as such, but it is becoming increasingly part of what we look at when it comes to conservation, either through buffer zones or through national extensions of these sites. 
Yeah, excellent. I mean, obviously, we're more and more aware of all the interconnected elements, so we can't just see a protected area in isolation, but as part of a, a larger seascape uh, or a landscape. So it's so great to hear that you're thinking about that. Um, well, I, I, again, we're, we're a little bit over. There's a few um, uh, additional questions here real quickly. Um, uh, what are the downsides of blue-green bonds from sort of government or um, especially the finance minister perspective? And then a related question is how how does the blue bond head the Belize blue bond hedge from financial risks, um, uh, especially uh, um, currency risks, um, if the instrument itself is in foreign currency? So, I guess Beverly, to you on these. I think one of the good things about the um... I can't answer for the finance minister and I, I, I want to put that out there, but we can um, um, get back uh, an answer that's not a problem. But one of the innovations with the Belize Blue Bond is that our payments are made in Belize dollars. Um, and so that was one of the things that um, that was put in there to, to, help, to help Belize. So like our um, conservation um, inflows and the payments that are made, they're they're made in in Belize dollars, and so that that helps us from a foreign currency perspective. In terms of the financial risk, that is, I I wouldn't be in a position to talk about that that part of it. Great, understood. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I'll just say that, you know, the decrease in the tax, uh, the, sorry, the debt obligation of the country was extremely beneficial to the country. And um, also yes, having such very a much highly, so. highly rated bond is also good for the um, uh, perception of the country um, in financial markets. So, yeah, um, it, well, that's one of the intangibles that actually came out of the blue bond deal in that it really, um, it, 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 facilitated and catalyzed a rebranding of Belize, um, really, and has made it um, an attractive partner now for private sector, really. Um, it has really trans allowed us to transform our profile. And so um, our successful delivery on, it, on, on, on this deal is very important for us to maintain that, that rebranding and that credibility that we've created. Um, because before we were known as a serial defaulter and our bonds, as, as you rightfully said, was being traded at a very um, low rating. And what this deal did, as you said, um, was to create the necessary credit enhancements for us to really trade high quality um, bonds. As a matter of fact, our bonds were oversubscribed. Um, and so... Um, it has really um, done a lot for us as from a country, as a country in terms of now being able to uh, partner and to also uh, mobilize more resources. That is excellent to hear and uh, really fascinating. What a model for for other countries too, which who are following. So congratulations on that and. Uh, I just want to, I know we're way over time. Thank you, everyone, especially you know, Fanny and um, Beverly for presenting and sharing your knowledge and insights. And um, please join the, the Reef Plus community. You can uh, continue the conversation there. And uh, just thanks everyone to, to, to my colleagues uh, for organizing and everyone at UNESCO. And uh, thank you all for listening. And we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.